Today we're going to talk about Russia, um, which you may remember from last year's sermons. Um, it's always Russia. There's always Russia. But uh, today we're very lucky to have with us Nick Burns and Bill Taubman. Uh, Nick was uh, ambassador to NATO, ambassador to Greece, under Secretary of State for Political Affairs. He knows the landscape, and he was incredibly involved with, in his early years, at the NSC, uh, when Henry, right? Was post Henry. Post Henry, when yes. there were End negotiations. Of the Cold War. End of the Cold War. Yeah. Anyway, Bill Taubman is um, uh, perhaps, not perhaps, is the, is the preeminent historian of modern Russia uh, alive today. And, um, it, and I can say that because I'm the moderator. Uh, also because it's true. Um, and I want to tell you, uh, begin with an anecdote. In the old days, when I was at Time Magazine, in the 90s, we decided that we were going to uh, make Mikhail Gorbachev man of the decade. Time Magazine had never done this, you know, it does man of the year. But we felt so strongly about Gorbachev that we were going to declare him man of the decade. I was part of a group of five or six journalists who went over to Russia, spent about a month there researching, writing, speaking to Gorbachev and other people. And we came back and wrote a very, very lengthy uh, uh, article, which actually took up most of the package of articles, which took up most of the magazine. And of course, we wrote it in that, what you're, if you recall Time Magazine, that breathless, omniscient Time style. And then I read recently Bill Taubman's biography of Gorbachev and realized that we didn't know anything. <laughs> and I mean anything. <laughs> Bill, um, first leave aside the fact that only two of us in this group spoke Russian, which we arrogantly thought didn't matter at all. Um, but seriously, Bill was a real historian. He had access not only to documents, but to the people who produced those documents. And when you talk about first sources and well, if, if journalism is the first draft of history, that's, this is real history. Um, it's not only about Gorbachev, but about the entire Soviet period. And I urge you to uh, pick it up, read it, buy it outside, and Bill will, Bill will sign it. And then to give a little bit of equal time, this is a book that uh, on Kissinger, The Negotiator. You may recall that Nick uh, spoke with Henry about his negotiating style last year at Kent Presents. Uh, Jim Sabinius is the lead author. Nick uh, contributed. It too is outside. So because we're really fortunate to have Bill Taubman with us, um, we want to begin uh, with Bill giving us kind of a short course of, about Russia, Russian history, um, through the post-Soviet Union period, bring us up to speed and locate uh, Vladimir Putin in the long sweep of, um, of Russia. As I understand my assignment, I'm going to talk about how the old Cold War ended and how the new Cold War that we find ourselves in today began. And it's not simply because one event followed the other, but because a man named Vladimir Putin learned some lessons from the way the old Cold War ended and the way the Soviet Union collapsed. And I think one key to understanding his behavior these days is to understand the lessons he thinks he learned from the collapse of the Soviet Union and Gorbachev's role in that collapse. I wanted to begin, however, by reminding us that 30 years ago, it, this summer, there was a summit meeting in Moscow between Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev. And it was a warm, cozy summit, celebrated afterwards in both countries. But I think the highlight was in the shadow of the Kremlin when an American reporter asked Reagan, 
what about the evil empire that you used to talk about so much? And Reagan, with a grin and a kind of nod of the head, said, that was another time. That was another era. And that indicated that in his mind, the Cold War was ending, if it hadn't ended already. So uh, on I go. Reaganites often claim that Reagan himself was the main man in ending the Cold War. And they point to the big military buildup he carried out, and the Star Wars program he initiated, and the belligerent rhetoric, <coughs> evil empire, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down that wall. And there is something to this, although not nearly as much, I think, as his champions say. I think this behavior of Reagan early in his term did underline for the Soviets how vulnerable they were, how backward technologically especially they were, and how much they needed some kind of new detente with the United States. But we also have to remember that Reagan turned to negotiating in 1985. And when he did, oddly enough, it turned out that he and Gorbachev were almost perfect partners, strange as that may seem. Now, I perhaps naturally, as a biographer of Gorbachev, give Gorbachev more credit for ending the old Cold War. And I want to give you a quick thought experiment to explain why. If we imagine no Gorbachev, and Reagan is negotiating with one of the other Neanderthals in the Politburo, the Cold War doesn't end. If we imagine no Reagan and Gorbachev negotiating with, say, George Bush, I think the Cold War ends. I think Gorbachev was the key. Um, he was unique, and this is very important to understand, among Soviet leaders. The other Politburo members who appointed him their leader in 1985 wanted moderate reforms of the Soviet Union. He wanted to transform the Soviet system. They wanted to ease the Cold War. He wanted to end the Cold War. He was in the Politburo. He had only three supporters out of the 12 to 15 members of the Politburo. All the others turned against him. And those three supporters would only have, were only there to support him because he had either appointed them or kept them on. Now, in my book, I talk about how Gorbachev became Gorbachev, how the regime made the mistake of appointing him its leader, how he and Reagan became almost perfect partners, how and why he tried to democratize the Soviet Union and failed. Uh, and if you're interested in buying the book, I will be outside later to, <laughs> sign, to sign it uh, in the hall there. But suffice it to say, at the moment, that both policy and personality brought Reagan and Gorbachev together. The policy that they both shared, the goal that they both shared, was the elimination of nuclear weapons. And there aren't too many other leaders who have wanted to do that or have taken that seriously. And I think Professor Kissinger, who was here yesterday, was not one who wanted to do that, nor was Margaret Thatcher. But at any rate, they shared that hope. And the other thing was a kind of mix of their personalities. They learned to like each other and to trust each other. Now, why did Gorbachev fail? Why was he ultimately ousted? Why did the Soviet Union collapse? And what lessons did Putin learn from that? Well, when Gorbachev opened up the Soviet system, it turned out that ethnic separatism reared its ugly head and political polarization, which may make even the polarization we have in our country today look mild in comparison. Radical Democrats, communists fighting each other, economic collapse. Uh, Gorbachev himself was initially very popular, but by the time all of these things started to tear at his system, uh, it turned out, and here we go back to your point, Michael, that Gorbachev's character, in a way, clashed with Russian national character, if we can accept that there is such a thing. The Russians like a strong leader. Gorbachev wanted compromise. It turns out that in the Russian language, which my wife, who's sitting in the first row, taught for 50 years in Amherst, compromise is a negative. It carries a negative uh, connotation. Gorbachev sought consensus 
The Russian way is to break through by force if necessary without waiting for consensus to form. Gorbachev talked a lot, too much. Russians tend to like strong, silent type leaders. And the two particular examples of things that Russians held against him that are most striking that we came encounter with was people would say, you know what's wrong with Gorbachev? He listens. <laughs> and another thing they said was, you know what's wrong with Gorbachev? He changes his mind. We think of these things as virtues. Yeah. They, not all of them, but a lot of them thought of these as vices and sins. Okay, let's move Gorbachev off stage and talk very briefly about Yeltsin and his partner, Bill Clinton. Yeltsin, in many ways, wanted to continue Gorbachev's efforts at democratization and encouraging of a market economy. It didn't bother him that one way he encouraged the development of democratization was to bomb the parliament, which he did, Yeltsin did. And of course, the shock therapy that he administered to the Soviet economy turned out to be more shock and less therapy. Things ended very badly with the uh, economy cratering and with the United States being blamed by many Russians for the advice we gave them in the 90s as to how to privatize an economy. And Russians often being wedded to conspiracy theories not only took the collapse, the further collapse of the economy following some of our advice as an unintended consequence, they took it to be an intended consequence that we wanted them, we wanted to weaken them in order to destroy them. And the first sign of Russian unease with NATO expansion occurred under Yeltsin in the first tranche of NATO expansion in 1999. Which brings us to Putin. There is some evidence that in the beginning, Putin was more open to democratization in Russia and to a open relationship with the United States. I could quote, but I won't. Two statements of his, I'll paraphrase them. In 2001, in a conversation with the Secretary General of NATO, Lord Robertson, Putin said, we want to be part of Western Europe. That is part of Russia's destiny. Well, he's certainly not saying that today. And in another exchange, he said, we would even like to talk about becoming a, a member of NATO. Well, that, of course, is not part of his of his uh, rhetoric today. It wasn't long before things went south and domestically he became the authoritarian leader that he is today, taming the press, taming the parliament, taming the oligarchs, and in foreign policy, of course, seizing the Crimea, invading Ukraine, intervening in Syria, and meddling in our elections. Now, I just want to say very quickly that he attributes this to his disillusionment with the West, and he cites various things that we've done that provoked him to do these things. One is the expansion of NATO. A second is the bombing of Yugoslavia in 1999. A third thing is the Iraq War of 2003. A fourth thing is what we did in Libya, where we got United Nations authorization to save <clears throat> the people of Benghazi, but ended up cooperating in the ouster of Gaddafi. And the fourth thing is the colored revolutions in Georgia, in Ukraine, the so-called colored revolutions, rose, orange, and even the Arab Spring, which he insists we were plotting, we were behind them. Now, I'm sure there are people in this room who might share his view that some of these things that I've just listed were not great things for us to do, like the Iraq war and maybe the expansion of NATO. But Putin, and this is, my explanation of Putin, which differs from his own explanation of himself. Apart from whatever we did, he had his own reasons for turning against us. He had his own reasons, he had a need for an external enemy to justify what he was doing at home. And so when he seized Crimea, it was partly to mobilize patriotic opinion and thus lift his popularity, which in fact it did. And the other thing about Putin that explains his behavior, which has nothing to do with us, is his KGB background. He learned, like the cop on the corner, 
that life is rough and tough. He is a man who believes that everybody lies and cheats and steals. And so when we say we don't, he thinks that's total hypocrisy. Uh, of course, we do some of that too, but I don't think we do as much as he does. Uh, so in the end, one might say, as Michael hinted, that this Russian political culture consisting of this notion that they need a strong leader and reflecting, as Putin does, his experience with dog-eat-dog -dog battles within the Soviet system. That is what contributes to his popularity, and that is what, in part, did Gorbachev in. The final thing I'll say is that the latest polls that I've read this week is that his popularity is dropping. And that's partly because of some of the reforms that he is trying to carry out, which involve, for example, raising the age of retirement from 60 for men to 65 for men and women from 58 to 63. So we'll see what happens. But that's where things stand. And before I turn it over to Nick, I just want to note that I have not mentioned the name Donald Trump. <laughs> right. But, but we'll I think get Nick into, will. <laughs> we'll get into that because we want. <laughs> well done. Because we really want Nick to this, take this phenomenal setup, this phenomenal understanding of, of Russia as Russia and Putin as Putin without regard to, to uh, whatever we have here in the United States and ask Nick to f bring us even further up to speed and flesh it out for us. Thank you, Michael. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here with Professor Taubman. We had not actually met until about 40 minutes ago, um, but I've always uh, had very, very high regard for him. I agree with Michael. He's our greatest historian on Russia in the United States. And if you have not read this <laughs> book, you've got to read it. I read it uh, last year, about the time I was at Kent. I then reviewed it for the Boston Globe, and it gave me insights. And I'm someone who worked at the NSC for five years at the end of the Cold War, between 90 and 95. So I was the young man sitting at the end of the table with President Bush taking notes, observing Gorbachev. But it filled in a lot of information, particularly about the infighting behind the scenes in Moscow that we were aware of but didn't know about in specifics. It's a, it's a beautiful book. So um, you're run, very, don't, you're very run don't walk <laughs> to the signing table. Um, so l let me just, if I could also just step back yeah. and say, as a diplomat, um, the Russian Revolution broke out 100 years ago, 1917, 1918. We've had no more difficult relationship with any country in the world over the last 100 years than, than with the Soviet Union and modern Russia. I mean, just think of it this way. Uh, we intervened in the Bolshevik Revolution to try to defeat it. We had American troops up in the Russian Arctic in 1919-20. The Harding, Coolidge, and Hoover administrations refused to talk to the Russians, to the Soviets, to Lenin and Stalin. It wasn't until FDR came along that we opened with Ambassador Bullitt, our embassy in Moscow in 1933. We had four brief years where we were allies, uneasy allies competing allies, but allies against Nazi Germany, and then 45 years of absolute Cold War rivalry, which went to the brink in October 1962. We came very close to destroying each other in that month, in that year. And then we had, really, in the, in the period that, that Bill has written about, between 1986-87 and maybe 1995 with Gorbachev and Yeltsin, I would say a partnership of sorts. We considered ourselves to be friends. The United States under President Reagan, particularly under President George H.W. Bush, then President Clinton, supportive of these reform efforts, very supportive of Yeltsin when he became Russian president. But for the last 20 years or so, with a couple of vignettes where Putin's offered to help us on terrorism, we've been rivals. So think of this relationship. It has not been a good relationship. Maybe it's because uh, of the fact that we're both great powers. We're continental powers. And maybe it's also because we've argued over Europe, and that's my second point. For the United States, beginning with Wilson, 100 mm -hmm. years ago at Versailles and his ill-fated proposal for the League of Nations, for FDR's <coughs> dream at the end of his life, for a democratic peace in Europe, 
and I think every American president since FDR, with the exception of President Trump, and I have to mention President Trump, has believed that a democratic peace in Europe, the survival of democracy and a peaceful Europe was just about the most vital thing that we could undertake in the world. Russia has been our opponent for most of the last 100 years in that effort to unify Europe, to keep it peaceful, and to keep it aligned with the United States. So of course we've been competitors with Russia, if you think about it in that dimension. That's why we expanded NATO. That's why Bill Clinton and George W. Bush and Barack Obama expanded NATO. It became clear to us by 1995, 96, for some of us earlier, and we all wanted Yeltsin to succeed, that he probably wasn't going to succeed. And that sooner or later, a strong man would come back to Moscow and try to relitigate what had happened at the end of the Cold War when the Czechs and the Hungarians and the Poles and the Romanians and Bulgarians and Slovenians and Slovakians and especially the Estonians, Latvians and Lithuanians liberated themselves. <clears throat> the latter three from the forcible incorporation over 50 years in the Soviet Union, the others imprisonment in the Warsaw Pact. When they liberated themselves, it meant that this long-held dream that we had for United Democratic Europe could finally be realized, and we were thinking in the Clinton administration, I was President Clinton's special assistant for Russia, that this was our chance. That the Russians would come back and try to reimpose their will not to conquer these countries through military expansion, but to hold them under their sway, to seek strategic depth south and west of the Russian borders, as the Romanovs and Stalin and the Soviet premiers, Khrushchev, Brezhnev, up to Gorbachev had tried to do. So we expanded NATO. And I know that you know, people like George Kennan, who could believe this was not a good thing to do. We invited George Kennan to the White House mm -hmm. in 1994. Uh, he had first worked there in 1927. He informed me when I met him at the front door of the White House. So you had to respect his extraordinary intellect and the expanse of his relations. He thought it was going to be the wrong thing that we'd drive the Soviet, the Russians to oppose us. Tom Friedman, friend of many of ours, did the same. But I'm convinced. I think a lot of us are convinced who served in those administrations of Clinton and Bush and Obama that we did the right thing. If we hadn't expanded NATO, you can be sure that Estonia and Latvia would have been assaulted by now. Estonia, one quarter of its population, ethnic Russian. Latvia, one third of its population, ethnic Russian. We did the right thing. And we have preserved the freedom of about 125 million people in Eastern Europe because of what we did in those three administrations. I agree with Professor Taubman. The Russians didn't like what we did, of course. In the second round of NATO enlargement, which was 2002 and four, I was the US ambassador to NATO. So I, in effect, negotiated this with the Russian government. We didn't negotiate it. We informed them. And we let them know ahead of time. Why negotiate with them? It wasn't their choice. Mm -hmm. We didn't want them determining the fate of the East Europeans as Stalin had after Yalta, the Russians were angry, I would say. Foreign Minister Lavrov, my counterpart, a guy you've heard about recently, Sergei Kislyak, who was the Russian ambassador to NATO. But they didn't end the relationship over it. In fact, the relationship was going pretty well because after 9-11, the Russians felt that they had an issue in common with us, counterterrorism. They had to deal with Islamic terrorism in the North Caucasus. Uh, we had a deal with Osama bin Laden. They ended the relationship with us over a different issue, over the American support, which was really rhetorical in many ways. It certainly wasn't strategic or military for Ukrainian rep the Ukrainian Orange Revolution and the Georgian Rose Revolution. That's what drove Putin ultimately to declare at the Munich Security Summit in 2007 that the United States had become, his words, like Nazi Germany. And after 2007, the Russians have been completely focused on undercutting the United States. But and, I think it's... And they've done a good job of it, right? Well, they've tried to, they've tried to knock us down as 
the largest power in the world, I think it's always galled Putin that he had to live in a world where the United States had infinitely more power. Mm -hmm. And so you can see that Putin's been trying to cut us down to size, interrupt our plans. Um, we had to oppose what he did in Crimea, February 2014, uh, right. because he crossed the brightest red line in the international system. He not only was the aggressor crossing a border, he annexed the territory of Crimea, which no European leader had done <laughs> since the 30s. And we had, would you like me to stop? No, 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 okay. no, no. And, he, and we had to oppose what he did in Georgia. The latest aggression has been his assault on our election in 2016, and assault's the right word, because they flooded our social media with millions of bits of fake news, in the words of Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. Just use the Trump words to confuse the American election. And if you listen to the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, Republican-led, Richard Burr's committee, and to the FBI and CIA, they got into the databases of 23 of our states who run our elections in this country. And I would say that the fundamental fault of President Trump is not to stand up to Putin in that in assault on the United States, on our democratic <clears throat> system, Let me and on our election. And I think that Trump, has, Trump is a singular figure in the history of the last 100 years. He has failed to recognize we have a competition with Russia underway. And it's a big competition, and the Russians are waging it. And Trump believes somehow that by being buddies with Putin, look at that Helsinki press conference, this is going to protect the interests of our country. The reverse is true. Putin respects power, but he doesn't respect weakness. Um, let, me, let me just uh, take this a little further in, in this sense. Um, I really don't want to... Uh, get into a psychological analysis of Trump's affinity for strong men or why he might, whether or not he's in Putin's pocket or any of that. Some of it may come out in the Mueller investigation if there's actual activity that warrants criminal charges or, or impeachment. Um, I want to step back to a geopolitical argument attributed to Henry Kissinger but even if it wasn't Henry who uh, offered it to the White House, um, the notion that in the larger world, with the rise of China, it's wise to try to cozy up, so to speak, to Russia, to be a counterweight to the rise of China, much as Henry and Nixon did with China as a counterweight to the Soviet Union. Does that have any charm for you as a, as a rational argument? Please. That's your... I'm, you're, <laughs> but I want to hear your... You're, you're the, G, the well, let's diplomat. Go, let's both offer our view. Yeah. It won't work. It won't Russia, work. Russia is, has the GNP of Spain. Russia <laughs> has nuclear weapons and a space program for the GNP of Spain. It's, it's not a counterweight to China. The answer to the China challenge is for the United States to seek, in a way, partnership with China in some issues, managing the macroeconomic mm -hmm. situation in the world, working together on climate change, which President Obama tried to do, and then competing with China to maintain our geostrategic position in East Asia through our alliance system. That's the answer. But the Russians, the Chinese will never see the Russians as some kind of counterweight. The counterweight to China is the American alliance with Japan and our new strategic relationship with India, which is a very broad military mm -hmm. relationship, and our alliance with Australia. That's the counterweight, but it's not Russia. Things have moved on since Kissinger's brilliant triangular diplomacy of the early 1970s. Do you think, is there anyone that you, either of you are familiar with in the uh, intelligence community, in the State Department now, in the NSC, who has any sense of these strategic issues? John Bolton doesn't seem to. He sees war everywhere. I mean, where are we? Who's thinking for Trump? Well, to be fair, you have in, you have in Jim Mattis a, a, a soldier <laughs> statesman, an intellectual, uh, who's steeped in history, Secretary of Defense. Uh, you have in Mike Pompeo someone who doesn't have that background, but he's hard-headed. That's a good thing to be. Mm -hmm. He's, he's tough-minded. He's not Trump. 
And despite my own battles, and they were considerable with John Bolton, when we served together in the Bush administration, we did not see eye to eye. He's a very smart man. And he does not favor the triumph of either Chinese authoritarianism or Russian authoritarianism. But Bill, you may have views on this. Well, I was, I was going to pick up on um, really one of the main themes of Nick's presentation. And that's this notion that if you look back over the last 100 years of US relations with the Soviet Union and Russia, you find only about six or seven years when we and they looked at each other as friends and partners. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, you could see the Putin uh, turn in Russia to authoritarianism from democratization and the return to Cold War as a reversion to the norm. All right, well then, then let me That's just... That's kind of discouraging. Let me just yeah. ask you this quickly then, Bill. Um, if you had these six or seven years and you had Gorbachev and then you had Yeltsin, and now you have Putin. Was, is Putin inevitable? Is there something seriously in the Russian character that made it uh, impossible for anyone like Gorbachev to last long term and therefore a Putin had to come out? Well, when I, as I wrote my book, I, I admired Gorbachev immensely. I think he's a hero for many of the things he did. But I think he's a tragic hero. And the reason is that he was up against forces which were beyond his control and which eventually overwhelmed him. In that sense, he was up against Russia itself with its, with its history of authoritarian rule, mm -hmm. never known democracy except for a few chaotic months, chaotic months in 1917, which produced Bolshevism. So, you know, you could, be, the Russians have lots of reasons to doubt democracy, both because of what it produced in 1917 and what they, many of them think it produced during Gorbachev and Yeltsin's period. Okay, we wanna, we wanna invite uh, questions from you all, but as you're lining up, I wanna ask uh, Nick this question. Um, it seems to me that Putin is on the world stage at this point, probably the ultimate risk taker. Look what he did in Crimea, look what he's done in Ukraine, look what he's doing in Syria. You mentioned the Baltic states and the expansion of NATO. And folks, if you look at this map and kind of try to understand um, what's going on here and where the Baltic states, where Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania are right above the purple of Belarus. Um, and you recall that the Crimean Peninsula the brown part at the bottom of uh, the south of Ukraine was, uh, re was annexed by him. Do you, is he, do you think he might make a move against those states? And if he did, do you think there's enough oomph in NATO or in Trump to re resist it? Well, first, I don't think he's a risk taker in geopolitically. He's the most experienced global leader in the world today. Okay. He is extraordinarily acutely intelligent He's tactically very agile. He's a considerable foe, but he respects strength. So the answer to your question, Michael, is under President Obama or President Bush or President Clinton, Putin came in just at the end of President Clinton's term in office. There's no way that Vladimir Putin would invade the Baltic states because he would know that that American president would bring down Article 5, the American military commitment in NATO to these countries. The problem with President Trump is, President Trump has said publicly this summer, not just during the campaign, this summer, well, I might recognize the Russian annexation of Crimea. He said that this summer. Mm -hmm. Then I think more damagingly, just after Helsinki, two hours after the Helsinki press conference, President Trump gave an interview with Tucker Carlson of Fox News in which he said, effectively, I'm not sure about our security commitment to Macedonia, the newest member, excuse me, to Montenegro the newest member of NATO. Article 5 has, this, this is an attack on one of us, it's an attack on all of us. The key article of the NATO Treaty of 1949 has always rested on one person, the American president. And the belief in Moscow that that American president had strength within him. And I think the Russians view Trump as extraordinarily weak. So why would they not make a move Because like Jim that? Mattis is Secretary of Defense. Can I and, might, and, and Mattis might be able to corner Trump and say, we're finished, and NATO's finished, unless we do this. 
Okay. Yeah, go I'd ahead. like to put in, a, believe it or not, a good word for Donald Trump. <laughs> um, when, when I listened to him uh, before Helsinki and at Helsinki, when he talked about the fact that there is some blame to be shared on both sides for the new Cold War, and when he talked about the need to talk to the Russians and perhaps you know, work out some kind of way of reducing those very high tensions, <clears throat> that seems to me right. The trouble is that he himself is an obstacle to doing <laughs> what he says needs to be done because he seems such a pushover for Putin and the Russians that he, Trump, has sort of mobilized the United States against the necessary negotiations which might, if they ever took place, succeed in somewhat lowering these unnecessary tensions. Okay. I don't know what you think of, of that, uh, I think Nick. <laughs> Um, okay, yes, sir. My question has to do with a little bit more in history um, and the expansion of NATO. Why is it in those years uh, of Yeltsin, when Russia was on its back uh, economically, a basket case, when we did the shock therapy, why is it that at that time we didn't do something like the Marshall Plan that we did for Germany and Europe after World War II? And in fact, bring Russia into NATO instead of the smaller countries. I know why we did the smaller countries to save and have, have freedom in that part of Europe. But why not Russia? Why not try to tame it in those uh, Clinton you years? Have yeah. you, uh, why didn't we move more quickly? What? And why didn't, um, at the end of the, after the end of the Cold War, why didn't we help Yeltsin more with the economy? Why didn't we help Yeltsin more? Yeah, mm. yeah. Um, so, so, sorry, sorry, and also bring him into NATO at that stage. Yeah, excuse me? And also to bring him into NATO at that stage. Yep. Just two points, and we'll, we'll both, I think, contend with this. Um, President um, George H.W. Bush, and particularly Bill Clinton, moved heaven and earth to help Yeltsin. Uh, we convinced the, the Congress in 1993-94 to launch a major multi-billion dollar package of economic assistance to Yeltsin. Clinton convinced the then G7 to, um, to allocate billions of capital support uh, to help support the Russian treasury. Uh, we sent legions of economic advisors, maybe sometimes with the wrong advice, as Bill said, um, in the early 90s, but we tried. We took the G7 and made it the G8 and made Russia the, mem uh, the eighth member in 1995. There's no question that Clinton and H.W. Bush tried everything they could to help Yeltsin. Why do we not make Russia a member of NATO. Uh, in the summer of 2001, it was being actively debated in Washington. I went out to NATO at the end of that summer. Putin gave a speech about a month after 9-11 in Brussels in which he said, mm -hmm. Russia does not want to be a member of NATO, but wants partnership with it. By the following spring, April of 2002, we'd established a formal NATO-Russia council. We gave the Russians a compound inside NATO headquarters, Sergei Kislyak became Russian ambassador. I was his counterpart. We met every week, the, Russia, the NATO ambassadors with Russia. We did projects together. We fell out with them for the reasons that Bill explained uh, and then I tried to explain as well. Russia never wanted a NATO membership when push came to shove. It, was, it's, it considered itself to be too great a power to be one of 27, 28 it's, countries. Let me think. just... Um, before, before yeah. I go back to you, I'm sorry, go Can, ahead. I'd, I'd like to respond to that question yeah. by slightly changing it. Yes. And that is, the, why didn't we help Gorbachev more? And actually, I want to put this to you, Nick, in part, because as I look back at it, it when George H.W. Bush was inaugurated in 1989, this followed a meeting at Governor's Island of Reagan and Gorbachev and Bush, at which Bush had promised that he would pick up and follow in Reagan's footsteps. He even joked that if I don't do that, somebody will be on the phone from California, namely Reagan, to remind me that I said this. But when they came in, there, was, there were several months of a kind of pause in which the Bush administration stepped back to make sure that Gorbachev was for real. I've read some of the memoirs of people like Brent Scowcroft and Robert Gates. Mm -hmm. And Scowcroft actually goes so far as to say he was afraid that Gorbachev might be more dangerous than his predecessors because he seemed to be such a nice guy and we would be less vigilant because he seemed like such a good guy. And yet 
in my view, that was a moment when we could have really helped. Gorbachev was not yet doomed. Later on, he was so close to being ousted. 89, he was still doing well. And yet, the first summit with Bush didn't take place until Malta in December, after Reagan had had five summits in three years. So I've asked myself, Nick, and you, since you were in the government at that point, do you, why, didn't, why didn't we help Gorbachev more, and was that indeed the mistake that I think it is? The pause in the first six months of, the, of, of 89 yes. was a major mistake, I think. Mm -hmm. in, um, in Why was it undertaken? Uh, I, think, I think for the reasons Bill cited, mm -hmm. Gorbachev had become this big figure in Europe. There was a feeling that maybe he would weaken support for NATO inside Europe. I think we misread him. We didn't believe at that time that he was the reformer that he clearly was. But, you know, I think Bush caught up. In 91, I went with President Bush uh, to Moscow. We gave full and stinting support when Gorbachev was overthrown for those three days in August 91 by the KGB and the military. Um, President Bush got on the phone with Yeltsin and encouraged Yeltsin to, to oppose us, which Yeltsin did. Mm -hmm. uh, and Bush and Gorbachev developed a very trusting relationship. The one thing Gorbachev asked us for, Shevard Natsa, the foreign minister, came to see President Bush right at the end of 1990, just before Christmas, and he said, we, we fear there's going to be a famine in the Soviet Union. We need emergency food aid. And President Bush sent um, Ed Madigan, the Secretary of Agriculture, to Moscow. We launched a major multi-billion dollar <clears throat> agricultural credits campaign to help support emergency food assistance. So I do think we got caught up. But mm -hmm. I agree with you, it was unfortunate we missed some time at the beginning of that year. OK. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, this is a very specific question, but do you think that the Budapest memorandum was a mistake, or do you think that in retrospect there could have been a more effective way of dealing with that issue? Okay, so this is the Explain. Budapest memorandum of December 7th of 1994. When the Soviet Union broke up on Christmas Day 91, it broke into, into 12 republics, Russia, Ukraine, uh, and, and, uh, and 10 others. Four of them had nuclear weapons. Russia and Ukraine uh, and Belarus and Kazakhstan. We felt strategically that that was a recipe for disaster of some warlord, perhaps in Central Asia, perhaps in Belarus, taking charge of a nuclear weapons arsenal. It, may be, it would be destabilizing to the rest of the world. So we went out, the United States, President Clinton, and negotiated with the Ukrainians and the Kazakhs and the Belarusians that they would give up their nuclear weapons. They would send them to Russia because we had trust in Yeltsin, and we felt that dealing with one nuclear power was more stabilizing than four nuclear powers. I think we were correct. To mollify the Ukrainians, that was the largest of those three, three states, they said, can you give us security guarantees that if we are attacked in the future by Russia, so think what happened then subsequently years later in 2014, you'll come to our aid. We said, we cannot do that. We only extend security guarantees to our NATO allies. Our Congress, our Senate would never ratify that kind of, and it wouldn't be smart of us to do it, but we can give you security assurances, and they knew what that's meant, that we would oppose <clears throat> any assault on Ukraine politically and denounce it in the United Nations, which President Obama did. This is 94 in 2014. So a lot of people are now saying, why didn't President Obama go to war with Putin over his aggression in Ukraine? Because he didn't want to start a nuclear war and because he had no legal or moral obligation to the Ukrainians to defend them with American military force four years ago. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes. Um, it appears that young Russians are being, um, are very perceptive to this nationalist message that uh, Putin is putting forward. Um, this does not seem to be the case in the United States under Trump. Um, does this seem like a diplomatic advantage for Russia and how do you believe that this may be exploited in the future? I hope I heard this correctly. I, 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 my hearing isn't perfect, like many of you, I suspect. Um, anyways, the question is why young Russians, could you say it again, sorry? Um, Louder. Or maybe you guys could paraphrase it. Putin's nationalism it's, seems oh. to be appealing to young Russians. Well, can I say this? Trump's nationalism does not seem to have the same resonance yeah. in the States. That was right. an right. ancillary comment. Yeah. Well, uh, of course, not all young Russians. In fact, some of the polls that I, I pay attention to Gorbachev's reputation as it deteriorates or <laughs> doesn't these days. And the polls seem to show that he retains some popularity among 
younger Russians because they understand that he opened the system in ways that allowed them to be free and to prosper. Whereas older Russians who remember the terrible shortages and, and difficulties of that time are much more against him. And I think the young Russians who remember Gorbachev for that reason are not out there in the streets uh, carrying banners for Putin. But you may be right that in general, young Russians are more susceptible to these nationalist patriotic appeals than young Americans. And that would, I guess, take us back to what they see as the loss of Russia's superpower status, its humiliation as they see it in the 1990s, its uh, loss of an empire, mm -hmm. uh, not only the East European empire, which it once possessed, but even the non-Russian Soviet republics, which it lost and became independent states. We have not had that kind of uh, trauma uh, the Russian trauma is somewhat akin to the German feeling uh, after they lost the war, which <coughs> contributed to the, the First World War, which contributed to the appeal of Hitler. So I guess we are doubly blessed in the sense that A, we haven't gone through that kind of period, and B, we don't therefore have this kind of nostalgia for a man on a horseback although I don't believe that Trump rides horseback. At least, <laughs> I think he prefers golf. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, so in my most paranoid moments, I feel like um, Trump is not only kind of giving Putin what he wants, but he actually wants Putin to kind of breach our, nation, our nation and uh, you know, bring in authoritarianism, bring in white supremacism, and you know, actually kind of open the doors to a real change in our country. Is that just paranoid? Go ahead. Can I guess I'd say that I, I wouldn't, I don't think that's what President Trump is trying to do, and I'm a, an opponent of President Trump, as it probably is clear. Um, what I blame him for is, you know, what Putin did in 2016 was an assault against our country, so the president's first obligation is to defend our country. And because the president is so self-centered and can only think of himself, his failure to defend us, because he fears that if he gives any legitimacy to this claim of Russian interference, it will delegitimize his own election. Because our intelligence community said he, the Russians intervened on behalf of the Trump, not well, to favor Donald Trump. Perhaps in collusion, perhaps not in collusion. I think that is a, uh, I think President Trump is failing to exercise the duties of the presidency by not defending us. And I, I, that's how I read this. I don't think President Trump is trying to establish an authoritarian state, but I do think he has authoritarian tendencies himself. Since we are now talking about Trump's psychology, <laughs> uh, it, it might make sense to talk for a moment about Putin's psychology as well. As a biographer, both of Khrushchev and now Gorbachev, I try to understand my subject psychologically, even though I'm not a professional. I don't have to tell you about Trump's narcissism, but I will say something about Putin. When Putin first became president of Russia, there was a kind of autobiography that was published. It's called First Person in English. It's not so much his autobiography, it's a series of interviews by Russian journalists with his family and friends uh, and others who knew him. And there's an interview with his uh, elementary school teacher, which I think is very suggestive. Um, she says at one point, oh yes, Volodya, he hates to be betrayed and he never forgives or forgets. And then there's another passage in which Putin himself remembers uh, the apartment building in Leningrad, which he, where he grew up, which is a very modest building, where he and the other boys in the building would engage in fights in the courtyard. And he describes a scene on the landing outside his apartment where he's chasing a rat across the landing. And he chases the rat up against a wall. The rat suddenly turns on him and he sort of smashes the rat or he, he closes a door in order to, to dispense with the rat. So if you take this 
picture of Putin, who is used to fighting with rats and never forgives or forgets when he is betrayed. <laughs> And you think of Trump, who I don't know whether he's ever fought with rats, but he's certainly consorted with some of them. Uh, but he, but he, do, he too doesn't forgive or forget when he's betrayed. And this is one of the reasons that's, one of the thoughts that's held me back from hoping that by some miracle, he and Putin could get together and cut some kind of deal that we might accept as rational, rational and, and sensible. And then I imagine a day in which one or the other or both decides the other has betrayed him and they both lash out at each other and we end up in a worse situation than we are now. I think that that's a <laughs> wow, perfect uh, uh, image to uh, end on. The, 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 um, just, just the idea that they could join to fight these rats. <laughs> Imagined or real is is it's delicious, and will lead us into Winton Marsalis in a few minutes. I want to thank Bill and, and Nick. This is this is wonderful. Thanks, Thanks Nick. I enjoyed it very much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, guys.